Um, welcome everyone and uh, thanks for joining us. So this is session 2A, Stimulants and Approaches to the Management of Stimulant Use. Um, my name is Leslie Buckley and I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, before I introduce our speakers and we start, uh, just a couple of reminders. So you can increase the size of the slide presentation if you want to. You might have already learned this already, but by selecting, uh, right-clicking on the presentation image and then selecting picture in picture, and then you can resize it. And during the presentation, you're welcome to put questions uh, on the chat and we'll be watching and monitoring them and then and then we can use those for the end question period. Um, and that's about it. So let me introduce our speakers. Tim Guimond is a psychiatrist and biostatistician at, um, at CAMH and the mental health director at HQ, a health hub for gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men and transgender and non-binary people. He provides clinical services to people with concurrent disorders and has provided education and substance use treatments to medical students, residents, and other healthcare providers in the area of MI, DBT, community reinforcement approach, and medication options. Tim's educational background includes medical school at the Johns Hopkins University, a psychiatric residency at the U of T, a Master of Science in Statistics and a PhD in Biostatistics from the Dalla School of Public Health at U of T. His research interests focus on psychotherapy, substance use disorders, HIV care, cost effectiveness, and semi-parametric Bayesian statistical techniques applied to problems of causal modeling. He learned to play, dun this is the most important part, he learned to play Dungeons and Dragons during the COVID pandemic and plays a monk, plays as a monk who is two and a half feet tall, uh, a two and a half foot tall wood elf. That's awesome, Tim. Um, and Tanya Hawk is an addiction psychiatrist, educator and researcher at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the U of T. She completed her undergrad, doctoral, and medical degrees, psychiatric residency, and master's of clinical epidemiology at U of T. Dr. Hawk has established a number of novel partnerships in the community, facilitating provision of specialized addiction psychiatry treatment within outpatient and residential community addictions treatment settings. Dr. Hawk is an educator in the area of stimulant use disorder treatment and a leader in advocating for improved access to evidence-based addiction treatment throughout Ontario. And that's it for me. And I'll hand it over to you, Tim and Tanya. Thank you. So we are going to, so I'm, I just had that moment of realizing I want to turn the beeping off. I don't know how to do it. So uh, welcome to the talk. Um, Tanya and I are going to kind of go back and forth here a bit in some slides. Um, the first thing that for us to tell you is that we had no financial support specifically for the development of these slides or this part of the program. Um, I have some uh, conflicts of interest to declare. So I have some financial sponsors. My, my role here at HQ is funded by the Ontario HIV Treatment Network. It is a, a Ministry of Health AIDS Bureau funded program. They provide me salary support and they also have competitive funds for research of which I am able, I have computed and received months for funds for a methamphetamine intervention study that Tanya is a co-investigator on. We also, uh, I'm a co-investigator on a grant from Gilead that is providing um, medications for a PrEP study that we are doing here in our sexual health clinic. We also get some program support from TD Bank uh, that provide money for a mental health crisis program and from Vive, which does uh, provide some HIV care coordination. Tanya, I'll let you. Yeah, thank you, and my, I mean, uh, uh just a financial relationship with a fellowship funding from Bellwood Health Services. And so today we will, just to kind of mitigate our bias, we will be talking about off-label pharmacotherapy treatments for stimulant use disorder and off-label treatments for stimulant-induced psychosis, um, both of which there are, there are no indications for. So these are all off-label and we will be using the generic names. Um, <clears throat> so here's our learning objectives for this next 45 minutes and then questions or 40 minutes. We want to review stimulant pharmacology so we have a bit of understanding of what it is about the pharmacological properties of the various drugs of abuse that are stimulant in nature. What, what are there for the effects, the risks, and what might it mean for the management? Uh, we then will turn our attention to the psychosocial treatments and do a little bit of an overview and what's common between them and the evidence that we have for the strongest amongst them. And then we will, and, and the limitations of those, and then we will move to our third focus, which is to talk about pharmacological treatments. 
uh, to identify the very limited uh, evidence-based options that are available and why they are limited and um, you know, what might be at the, the cutting edge and what we can do in treatment given the state of the evidence so far. Um, so as we start off with pharmacology, so most of these drugs, uh, stimulant drugs, work predominantly through dopamine. And so here's the structure of dopamine, Ritalin, and cocaine. You can see the, the part that is actually probably binding into the receptor is close to the ring plus the two oxygen groups. And the other drugs, therefore, that have very similar structures um, are the amphetamine class of drugs. So you can see that here in the lower left corner, we have amphetamine. Amphetamine has that same ring structure, doesn't have the two oxygen groups, but has a methyl group um, at the end here. The methamphetamine adds an additional methyl group, sorry, to the end of that structure. And things like ecstasy and the, the various forms of ecstasy, MDMA, MDA, similarly have these very similar structures. Now, what's important about this is that actually the methyl group added to methamphetamine slows down its metabolism, uh, which leads to it having a longer effective half-life. Um, as a similar sort of port part is there for MDMA and MDA, although it turns out that for whatever reason, by being in the structure of MDMA, uh, first pass metabolism will reduce most MDMA to MDA, and that they metabolize more quickly than, than methamphetamine or amphetamine. The way that they function is that <clears throat> cocaine and the, the same, to some degree, amphetamine and methamphetamine will all at least do this, which is they block uh, the dopamine reuptake. And that blockade of the dopamine transport of the reuptake is what keeps dopamine in the cleft, which is what leads to the effects of these drugs. Now, from cocaine to other methamphetamine are additional effects. Sorry, I was a little bit sorry because I expected this to be second. I'll go back in a second. So methamphetamine, in addition to causing that the receptor to be blocked, it also fuses presynaptically to cause vesicular fusion to cause increased dopamine release. It also postsynaptically causes some G protein um, activation so that the dopamine that is released has more of an impact. It is also affecting microglia cells and binds to a TL4 receptor on microglial cells, which leads to some inflammation. And there's additionally some reactive oxygen species that are created through the methamphetamine in the cell, which leads to some of the toxicity that we see with methamphetamine over what is seen with amphetamine or cocaine. So these additional pieces are kind of leading to more intense experiences on methamphetamine because it has a methyl group at the end, it has a longer half-life. So all these things together make methamphetamine a more potent version of what we see in cocaine or amphetamine. Um, so then looking at this, you know, we think of cocaine has a half-life somewhere between 45 and 90 minutes. Um, because cocaine has both a base and a acid form, one can be injected, the other can be smoked, which is the difference between crack cocaine and, and, and snorted cocaine or injected cocaine. Some people will take crack cocaine and reacidify it by adding lemon juice or citric acid. Um, when they use lemon juice, there's some additional risks, of course, that that have that come from the other things that might be in lemons. When people actually do that, is it because known as something that can be done on the streets? So, amphetamine has a six to fifteen hour kind of half life, and methamphetamine is often said to have a similar half life. But initially, methamphetamine is metabolized through to amphetamine, and there is a, a a delay that takes about 90 minutes or it's a 90 minute half-life for that part of the process so it ends up with a longer half-life than amphetamine the dopamine is affecting the nuclear accumbens that leads to the reinforcement effects and it tends to deplete other neurotransmitters this is often why people in a withdrawal will have a pretty severe depressive episode or a depressive phase and it's one just interesting factoid is that seven percent of cocaine users develop dependence in the first year of use Methamphetamine um, really can give people CNS stimulation up to six to 24 hours. And because 
it can both be dissolved and it can be um, vaporized at the temperature at a low temperature of a butane lighter it means that this is a very flexible drug that people can ingest they can smoke they can use it intranasally they can use it intravenously so it can be used in many many different ways and the harms of course associated with each of those uh, manners of use can, kind of can be compounded uh, it's also important to know that methamphetamine has two, just like amphetamine, has two isomers, and one of them turned out to be more potent. There was a period of time where the synthetic route in the 1990s, late 2000s changed by the U.S. government's clamping down on the precursor chemicals. This was actually quite problematic because people end up with much more potent methamphetamine. We were hearing from users that this is more potent, it's causing more problems. Most of us said that the drug is a drug is a drug, and we had failed to recognize the, the stereoisomer and it turned out to be an important chemical uh, property. So amphetamine use was kind of declining into the mid 2000s, but it seems to be increasing again. The amphetamine stimulants were prescribed widely in the 1950s, mostly for mood and weight loss, and they were rescheduled as, as, um, as scheduled drugs in the 1970s. Uh, there may be some genetic components to people's risk, you know, probably based on receptor polymorphisms or the transporter polymorphisms. The methamphetamine use is pretty low in the general population, 0.3% of the U.S. Um, it's gone up to 0.9% in 2021. And cocaine was 0.7 in the U.S. in 2015, up to 1.7 in 2021. But in some specialized clinics, like in our clinic here, working with gay men, we see a 6% uh, rate of reported methamphetamine use. And you may find in certain groups of people, homeless individuals, you might find higher rates. There certainly is a kind of link between people using opiates and stimulants at times. Uh, this is the, it's a long history of like cocaine and heroin, but now we might more often see methamphetamine and fentanyl. Um, and just some gender issues. I want to give a shout out to Dr. Suzanne Turner, who provided some of these points about um, thinking about those who are assigned female at birth and pregnancy issues. So while most drugs affect both men and women similarly, stimulants are a bit of an exception. The mood impacts can be have interactions with the menstrual hormonal fluctuations. And there are additional risks in pregnancy. It's important to keep in mind is risk of preeclampsia, which is 9.3% with methamphetamine, 4.4% with opioids, and 4.8% in general. So really it, it's in methamphetamine we worry about this. Placental abruption is, is higher even than, it's also present more in opiates, but even more present with methamphetamine. And preterm deliveries are, are a risk. And you know this is partly believed to be due to placental vasoconstriction, which decreases oxygen and nutrients and, and increases mother's blood pressure. The, um, there aren't specific fetal abnormalities. However, the appetite suppression that comes with the stimulant drugs can lead to small for age babies, um, this is particularly seen with methamphetamine and also shorter length, and which is not really made up over time. The weight might be made up at the, the length, and so small stature uh, is part of the consequences. Um, pregnant individuals who are using are less likely to come for prenatal care, and there's probably some behavioral consequences seen at one year, and it is in breast milk. And so, um, you know, typically we would advise people to wait 48 hours before they're last use uh, for breastfeeding and that's just based on case studies. Uh, something that if you were in the talk that Tanya and I had and Tanya was talking about before, salience um, is an important concept. People think of dopamine as a reward chemical but it's better to think of it as a thing that lets you determine when something is salient. Frightening things are noticed, um, surprising, exciting things. Dopamine fires in all of those situations. This is probably why when people pair methamphetamine use or other stimulant use with other activities, those activities become very um, accentuated as well. So sex with methamphetamine becomes a bit. Uh, I've used this particular image because if you look at it one way, you'd see mountains and, and trees. If you look at it sideways, you'll see uh, a mother and child that have their hands sort of in a prayer posture standing. But to be able to see the second takes a bit of refocusing of her eyes and looking for it. And that's the idea of salience, that something might pull out of the background and now be noticeable. You might notice with psychosis with, with the stimulant drugs that things that were unimportant now take on very key importance. And that's part of what we think happens in, in the initiation of some of the psychotic symptoms. 
these are criteria for all use disorders, the stigma for stimulants. So I think people in this group will know these well. And all 11 criteria are possible, you know, unlike for some things where there isn't a tolerance and withdrawal, there certainly is tolerance and withdrawal in the stimulant drugs. Stimulant withdrawal for the DSM-5, we know that it has a period that we think it comes in these waves, but there's dysphoric mood, depression, there's fatigue, people will often have some insomnia, but sometimes hypersomnia, they can't quite get to sleep even though they're very tired. Uh, they can have very vivid and unpleasant dreams emerge during withdrawal phase, be much hunger, eat much more, and be either very agitated or quite psychomotor retarded. So th th there's kind of like opposing things that happen, but there's this phased kind of way. We I have clinically seen a lot with people who've used routinely that in a in a withdrawal during the dysmorphic mood, they might have suicidal ideation or nihilistic thinking. And this can be very prominent two to three days and then can hopefully will resolve. But if a person then resumes their use at this point, they might have this cycle of frequently either being high or in a depressive phase and believing themselves to have a depressive disorder. Um, and there's normally a crash where people sleep a lot more afterwards. And so some start going back and forth between a sleep and wake cycle between uh, stimulants and benzodiazepines or alcohols or other sedating drugs like GHB. And so sometimes in withdrawal, you actually have to look out for withdrawal from several different things because they may have developed tolerance to more than one. Um, there's a, an interesting article. This is Shoptow and Lee talked about the management of psychostimulant withdrawal. Uh, there's the evidence suggests there's not very good um, medication management for this. Uh, we'll get more into the, the treatment parts later, but they also highlight this different phases. So the depression, anhedonia, anxiety, irritability tend to be early in the first week. And then people have this early protracted where most of those symptoms go away, their mood feels a bit better, but they're still left with some cognitive dysfunction, some dullness, some potentially ongoing lower grade depression or anxiety symptoms and cravings become very intense here. And so people will describe these periods of high risks when, when they're in withdrawal to relapse to use. The psychosocial treatments, um, this is, comes from a, a review article in 2014. There's not a, a huge change from, from then and what we see as being particularly useful. For goals of abstinence, the matrix model, a 16 week model that combines CBT with family education and self-help participation that focuses on relapse prevention, drug avoidance, identification of triggers, and drug refusal. This, this has the most evidence from all the sort of treatments and is often a core part of other types of studies when other medications are tested. This is frequently the core portion. Contingency management has a lot of evidence. In a second, I'm going to turn this over to, to Dr. Hawk and let her explain more about what the contingency management evidence is. There's also a, an older history though of community reinforcement and cognitive behavioral therapy being useful. Um, these are smaller studies. And so I put question marks here only because they're smaller studies weren't as replicated. They often though fit are the base of and the background to those other psychosocial treatments. So learning them is often very helpful in order to think about how we can approach uh, problems. Um, there's for people um, looking at people who are trying to achieve a reduction in use, both CBT and CRA have been shown to have some help there. And then finally, we use symptom management, but we'll come back uh, to these medications a bit later. In withdrawal, uh, antipsychotic medications and benzodiazepines can be of use. Uh, a very important thing, thank you, Dr. Hawk, for this slide, that um, you know, we have to remember that chronic cocaine or amphetamine use is really associated with cognitive impairment. And that lasts for quite a while and actually becomes a difficulty in many of our programs, which require a lot of thinking that cognitive behavioral therapy asks people to really think through what are the triggers? What are the, what are the environmental cues? How could you be thinking differently? It often uses very structured forms. For some people, these are very difficult tasks to use. One of the things that we've done in some of our programming is to allow people to come back for a second or third try. We've simplified forms. Uh, um, I know that uh, Dr. Hawk has done that a, a number of times, making forms just simpler and easier for people to use so they can wrap their head around it so you can build up in complexity over time as people are recovering. You know, this is these cognitive problems are likely due to these high levels of dopamine with the reactive oxygen species causing this neurotoxicity. And because of all those other 
glial cell impacts that we have this neurotoxicity and stress. The good news is that people do find that these things improved. Although for some people here, we say nine to 12 months. I have a little book here that uh, people with lived experience have written and, and many of them say it takes up to two years to full of ab full abstinence to fully feel like their brain is working back like it used to. And so this, these problems with executive function really kind of can impair us in these cognitive based treatments and may explain why we don't get great outcomes and we also find a lot of problem with people being retained in treatment between the chaos of use, but also just like this may feel like such a challenging thing to do that people are like, I'm not understanding and they kind of leave it. Um, this is the community reinforcement approach is what's called a functional analysis this is how we structure thinking about like, what's the function behind your use? And we do this sort of a question with people going through what are those triggers, they're internal and external, starting with the external things, who are you with, where are you, when do you usually use, what, and internally, in a cognitive behavioral sense, we think these internal states are triggered by our response to the external in our thinking. So what am I thinking about before I use? And then how do I feel physically and emotionally might be the consequences from that line of thinking. That this, in CBT, we might unpack those first questions and help people understand how they might change, how they react to triggers, avoid them in some situations, or change their thinking and try to get different reinforcement patterns. In CRA, we then want to look forward and say, well, what do you like about using in that situation with those people at those times? What are the pleasant thoughts that come? What are the pleasant emotions you have? What are the pleasant sensations you have? And by understanding the positives, we can understand the values that are driving people engaging in the stimulant use. And the second principle of community reinforcement approach is, can you find some healthy alternatives that would serve the same function, but that would not bring about the negative consequences that you see? Now, if you go with, through this exercise with someone and you go through first of those four columns and you don't talk about the negative consequences, they're going to say, this is a great idea. Look at all these great things I get from my use. So we want to Go to the last column and remind people there is a cost to this that you're paying and to help them notice that the costs that they're paying are accruing over time. The other thing that typically happens is people in noticing those things that are accruing recognize that they are the same triggers that they described in the first two columns. And so, you know, I, the cost to me physically and emotionally leads to depression and I use because I feel depressed. And so now people can start by just writing it outside of themselves and down a piece of paper, they might recognize a cycle they're in and they're in a bit of a trap. And that's part of the power in CRA. And then working through, well, you used to do healthy things that probably brought positives. Those positives would come in the long term with short term expenses. Any of you like myself who've tried to go to the gym to exercise, you do not leave like Arnold Schwarzenegger after the first time you go, and you generally are like kind of sore. So you pay the cost first and you get the benefits later. So that's kind of part of, of a side here. We will get to medication pieces in a second. I'm going to now just say that these are common things that you hear about people talking about functions of use and stimulants. I have more, my senses are acute for our people who say, I do better artwork. I do better, right? This sort of piece I hear frequently, or I've got more energy. I can get things done or I have less appetite. I'm losing weight. I look the way I want to look or I don't sleep. I don't have to worry about someone stealing my stuff in the shelter I'm staying in and that I have faster reactions time. I can, I can do better at the gym. I can exercise better kind of attitude. And then the psychological effects of feeling alert, better mood, increased sex drive, getting rid of boredom, feeling less lonely. Those are very common reasons people cite as well. Um, People have sex on meth because it feels good. It's very common with gay men. It can be common in sex trade. It may have something to do with also eliminating shame that might be associated with these things. So sometimes I just ask people about those links. And some tips for stopping when they overlap is that some people will have to address this as a combination behavioral problem to, to reduce or abstain from sex in a way so in order to be able to reduce or abstain from methamphetamine. And making new associations, having new sexual behaviors becomes important and avoiding triggering situations that led to their use in a sequence, which could also be, I might drink before I use a stimulant. And so addressing alcohol use problems may be important too. Tanya, do you want to talk about community management? Let me know when you want me to go forward on slides. 
Okay, yeah. So contingency management is framed as a psychotherapy. Some of you probably attended other talks from the Brant Haldeman Norfolk Graham about this and using this in the RAM clinic, but basically based on operant conditioning. Um, so that's really convenient and helpful uh, when someone is having cognitive effects of using stimulants. I will just say it's a psychotherapy, but it's perfectly suited to all of these issues. It's quick, it works, and it works better in uh, individuals who have these complex needs, like maybe not having housing or having concurrent psychosis or having cognitive effects. Basically, you're targeting a very clear and measurable behavior like abstinence from stimulants. You can't really measure reduction in use. So it ideally has to be a goal of abstinence. If someone doesn't have that goal, we totally understand. We just wouldn't recommend a urine-based testing method. Um, it could be something like, I want to come to the clinic. Um, it might be something else like coming to a group that is really clear and you can measure. And then providing some kind of concrete reinforcement, which was initially money, but has moved to goods or prizes just because it's cheaper to provide those, um, contingent on that target behavior happening. Next slide. Yeah. Um, so basically the principles, there's this wonderful textbook by Nancy Petrie who did um, really amazing randomized control trials. This is something that uh, has been extensively tested, uh, mainly in the 90s. There have been just tons of RCTs really looking at nuances of CM. It is an established treatment. It's just never gotten off the shelf because it's been hard to find funding for it. Um, but in, in a nutshell, you monitor the behavior frequently. There's the textbook. Tim has. So twice a week for stimulants. In our RAM, we offer this only for stimulants just because funding is limited and we don't have other good treatments for stimulants. So we don't have like an OAT that works that well. We don't have uh, an anti-craving med that works like naltrexone does for alcohol or campersate. So we've consolidated our funding and it just happens to work well pharmacologically because you can measure it twice a week and capture most cocaine or methamphetamine or amphetamine use. Um, and then you provide rewards every time um, that there's a negative sample. So basically every time uh, the sample, the urine sample is negative um, and that there's an increase. So the more consecutive negative samples you get, the more prizes you could potentially win. Um, the way we do that is people are drawing out of a prize bowl um, every time they have a negative sample and the more consecutive negatives they have, they'll get more times to pull out of that prize bowl. Half of the things in that bowl are not winners, they're just like motivational statements, and half of them are prizes, ranging from small, medium to large, or jumbo prizes. So jumbo might be a smartwatch, small might be a chocolate bar, and they get to pick from a range of prizes in that category. Um, and if they have a non-negative sample, if they've used, we just, there's no punishment, it's just uh, support and come back and do this again. How can we support you? How can we help you? Um, we're already doing this with, with take-home doses and Starbucks is definitely doing this to me all the time um, as are many businesses because it does work and we're all uh, you know, reinforced by dopamine. So certainly there's some clients who don't want to do it, but for many people it's a very safe and, uh, and helpful strategy. Next slide. Uh, lots of evidence. Again, this is something that has been extensively researched. I can't say this enough just because often I'll present on this and people will say like, does it work? That sounds really radical. That sounds really bizarre. Um, this is, you know, extensive control trials have been done on this approach with a really nuanced um, aspect. So you can really see some of it. So for example, we know that contingent reinforcement versus non-contingent reinforcement works better. The rewards do need to be contingent on the behavior. Um, if it wasn't contingent, we didn't get, we didn't get the, the desired behavior. Um, and this has really had some of the best benefit of any psychotherapy for stimulant use. Um, and just looking at patient population, so there's so few psychotherapies, and I say this as a psychiatrist, but so many psychotherapies have been developed not for our population. So, uh, exclusion criteria have been anyone with psychosis, anyone who doesn't have stable housing, anyone with a severe trauma history, anyone with recent self-harm. Um, that, you know, that excludes a lot of people when they're conducting trials of, of non-pharmacologic uh, interventions. And in general, contingency management works better or as well in, in those complex populations. It's a quick intervention. The total visit can be 15 to 20 minutes um, twice a week. Um, it's okay with comorbid illnesses like schizophrenia. It's okay with cognitive um, sequelae of a variety of things, even other things like uh, traumatic brain injury. 
Um, trauma uh, symptomatology does not interfere in treatment and people might respond better. Um, now that said, it's not treating the complex mental health needs. So there's still a major importance in making sure that people are getting access to treatment for their co-occurring psychosis or PTSD or depression or other mental health needs. But you can safely treat, the, if they have a goal around uh, stimulant use, you can treat that at the same time. Um, and it's worked well in populations um, that may not have housing. The only population where it hasn't worked super well has been in the forensic system where there's such strong contingencies already in place, for example, related to urine testing, that this added uh, contingency hasn't really helped. And so I'm gonna now kind of shift our focus to pharmacological. We're gonna do the same thing I'll start and then and, and Dr. Hawk will kind of finish up. The, the pharmacological treatments, um, I'm going to first look at methamphetamine, amphetamine um, treatments. The, the reason is just because there was a 2020 uh, review article in CMS Drugs that really goes well through this. Um, and the citation is at the bottom. My printer has decided that I'm not gay enough, so it's making every page pink for some reason. But this is a, a really useful article. It goes through bit by bit. The aminopine is uh, had less depression and withdrawal, this has been removed from the market, so it is unimportant to us. Mirtazapine, interestingly, had two, a very small trial that was positive with only 20 people, a repeated trial with 31 people that was negative, but a sub-analysis of the men who have sex with men in it has positive, so a, an RCT was done just with men who have sex with men, which had a positive result. Uh, there is another RCT since then I'll talk about in, in a couple minutes. Bupropion, um, on the other hand, has had now six different trials and really there's been no, in their primary outcomes for each of these trials, there was no statistically significant improvement. Um, there were post hoc analyses that suggested that it might be useful for light users. So, and the light for this was defined as less than 18 days at a 30 in the month or as, sorry, as, I am going to have lost it. Sorry, um, I can't re recall the other. But but essentially, was again out of a six sorry out of a six week or six year in drug screens in the two weeks before they started, people who had two or less positive urine drug screens at baseline, those individuals. So that's now starting to sound like somebody who uses like it once every couple of weeks type of of or less was for the other, that other study. So, so bupropion may play a role, but for a subset of people. Sertraline is important to note, had an increase in positive urine drug screen, so actually is contraindicated. Amipramine showed no difference. Adamoxetine, uh, initially the study showed more urine drug screens were, were negative. However, the number of days that people seem to be abstinent was less by self-report. So it's kind of mixed results, even within their own study. Aripiprazole, there were three studies that the final study was actually terminated early because while the first two studies had no impact, the last study showed increases in methamphetamine use and was stopped early due to an interim analysis. To pyramid, uh, two studies have been done, found no significant differences. Um, there, might, there was some interim benefit, but later there was not. The um, the next set of things that have been tried have been stimulant-like drugs. So dexamphetamine, methylphenidate, and modafinil. Uh, these three, again, uh, two studies of dexamphetamine showed no differences in the planned analyses, perhaps reduced cravings. Methylphenidate, again, three studies, the two largest ones showed no difference. The last one showed less craving and some less use by urine drug screen. There's a thought that it's possible that people have reduced cravings may in fact, um, it's hard to, to know what to make of this because they're getting both the stimulant from us and so they may have less cravings, but it may not be resulting in a change in their use patterns. Modafinil, uh, there were four studies with no difference. Baclofen versus gabapentin versus a placebo. There were no differences between the three arms. Buprenorphine showed some reduction initially, but that by the end of their follow-up period had been washed away. 
Uh, this was a, a 16 week study, buprenorphine versus methadone. Uh, so there was not a placebo arm in here. This was for inpatients, again, like the last day with buprenorphine, they found reduced cravings. None of these individuals had any use because they were in a residential controlled environment where they had no access. So it's unclear what would have happened in an, an outpatient setting. Um, naltrexone has been studied in four studies. Um, there were you know, two studies that seemed to have some benefit, but three larger studies that showed no differences. And then adonsetron has been tested with um, no differences. It was trusted at three different dose levels. Varenicline, sorry, varenicline was used um, in one single study. There were no differences. They noted, I thought this was a little interesting and comical, but they did, however, get some reduced cigarette smoking. So it's a good thing that's its indication. NAC was used um, in two different studies, one alone and one with naltrexone. The one with naltrexone had no differences. The one uh, study with just NAC had reduced cravings, but there was an optional matrix model. And there was a question of whether or not some individuals in different arms might be differentially picking to do the matrix model. And that might explain differences. There's an interesting trial here of Rilazul, which is another glutamatergic agent like NAC. Um, it's fairly new. It has not been replicated, but it had higher retention and abstinence at the end of the treatment period. Um, and, um, and then a CRF antagonist, Pecosterfront, has less cravings, but no difference in use. And Flumazil, Gabapentin, and Hydroxazine was sold as a, a single pill. Had two studies over the course of one year that essentially the first one had a bit of suggestion of improvement, but the next study showed none. So this is, a, the news is kind of like, there's not a great thing here with the except, and the other part is the limitations of all these studies is they've excluded people with concurrent mental health problems. I mean, I might be seeing a very biased sample as a psychiatrist, but I, frequently think that people with stimulant use also tend to have mental health problems as well. That's up to 40%. Lots of times it means the types of people we might be treating are going to be excluded from these studies. I'm going to turn this over now to Tanya to talk about the stimulant questions, which I know people are, are asking lots about. Yeah, and I'll say I think this is really um, a, a massively evolving area and there's questions about um, uh, Vyvanse, for example. So there's a been a couple of increasing studies over the last couple of years. Um, certainly in the older kind of reviews from 2017, they weren't recommending them in withdrawal unless part of a trial. Um, in the 2016 Cochrane review, it was really like apples and pineapples and like any other things being mixed together. So, um, you know, bupropion, everything from bupropion to modafinil to methamphetamine was being compared, which is a huge difference in terms of amount of dopamine released. Um, it seemed like maybe there was some evidence to cocaine, which I'll get to, but not for methamphetamine. And then psychostimulants did not seem to improve retention and treatment. So I think that's a big takeaway that if you are using them, the evidence compared to opioid replacement, stimulant replacement has not shown the same kinds of retention and treatment that we've seen with methadone, buprenorphine, and so on. Um, but these are generally small studies. Um, this is probably the take home message here and to Tim's earlier comments about methamphetamine and like bupropion, for example. Um, for all of these studies, you're going to see more of a signal with cocaine. It's much harder to imagine replacing the dopamine surge for methamphetamine than it is for cocaine. Um, and a lot of the evidence is a lot better. So um, it does, uh, with dexamphetamine or Vyvanse, for example, more of a response uh, if you're looking at cocaine uh, and cravings um, compared to uh, methamphetamine. It's, I think, quite hard because sometimes it's hard to know what the pre-existing diagnosis is, especially with ADHD. If you don't have, you know, other information about the person, I'm trying to answer some of the questions that have come up. Um, if there's evidence of uh, supporting retention or improving benefits from treatment programs by adding prescribed stimulants for the executive function, I know this is something Tim and I have discussed. Um, I don't think we know the answer to that. If the replacement actually helps the cognitive effects enough, or if they're just, if it's such an like injury to the neurons that they just really need to heal, I think that's an open question that really could use uh, a study and some uh, empirical testing of cognition um, to actually know the answer to that. Um, this study is, um, just as a comparison, uh, how these studies are done is very different. So some of them have been done like, you know, here's a large amount of, of uh, 
stimulant to take home uh, compared to how we would normally do opiate agonist therapy, totally different things. So this was a study of highly monitored individuals who were getting either methadone or heroin in a supervised setting, like, like IOT essentially, um, and had a separate goal of, of specifically reducing crack cocaine use. Um, so that's, again, we're looking at cocaine, uh, which generally responds better to prescription stimulants in a highly supervised population uh, with a highly monitored and observed sustained release dexamphetamine, and, uh, and it was randomized. Uh, and that, uh, that helped a much higher percentage of people um, get abstinence from, uh, from cocaine. But again, uh, they excluded anyone with acute psychosis, which is a really big deal because many of the patients where we're actually talking about doing this have had recent acute psychosis. Uh, next slide. And I, I would sort of add, which is kind of key, think about like why substitution works. Like if you've gone for something with a short half-life to a longer half-life, when you've got heroin going or fentanyl going to methadone, you know, similarly crack and cocaine to the stimulants we have has a longer half-life, but you want people to come off of it so they can sleep at night. This is the dilemma. Um, so substitution therapy, this one is, this is the most recent study now um, done in, in adults diagnosed with amphetamine or methamphetamine use disorder without a previous diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. So they excluded anyone, and this is, this is a cohort study, but in, you know, in a, in a population where they have really great population level data, they can very easily identify people with a past history of psychosis. Um, they included a variety of different medications and they found that uh, lisdexamphetamine or Vyvanse was associated with a decrease in hospitalization for substance use disorder compared to, for example, benzos, which, were, which would increase that. Um, you know, it's a cohort study, it wasn't controlled, but that, that is a signal. I don't think we know the answer to these questions completely in terms of somebody with pre-existing ADHD. I think it can be difficult to make that diagnosis, even if we're sure, and sometimes we are. I mean, sometimes I get IEPs from, you know, grade six to nine, and I have like that data. Um, I think then it's reasonable to treat, but to do that carefully. So if there's been recent acute psychosis, which especially if it's had uh, major, you know, life effects to be cautious with using a prescription stimulant. Um, and then if you are using one to do that with monitoring and, and there may be a dual purpose, right? It might be both for cravings and for the ADHD. And so then, you know, really we're kind of, we're not with a lot that we can recommend, right? There's really no medications that have been consistently shown to be useful. Or one little exception here is that for gay men, uh, by men, men who have sex with men, mirtazapine has now had two RCTs that show benefit, including the second study had 120 randomized individuals um, who had a decrease in use with a dose of mirtazapine, 30 milligrams. So at this point in my practice, because that's generally who we're seeing here at the sexual health clinic, um, this is something we use. Uh, it is not a large effect size, but it is a consistent signal at this point. And so, you know, combination treatment um, when we combine and here by combination we mean psychotherapy and and the medications it's important to keep in mind that when mo almost all of our medication trials are done in the setting of offering some sort of psychosocial intervention frequently it includes contingency management although not always and sometimes there's there are kind of four by four or two by two table kind of uh, testing where they do contingency management plus or minus drug, drug plus or minus contingency management. And so these often find that the combination of contingency management and medications are very useful. And so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a reminder to us that to try to beef up our psychosocial treatments while we provide these medications that we attempt to use. Uh, this sort of piece I think was talked about previously in the psychosis. For the, in the interest of time, I'm going to move us forward um, and and just say that you know we we worry about uh, stimulant induced psychosis. These are individuals who have been excluded from other studies. Treating psychosis in and treating other mental health conditions within, whether it's ADHD, with other techniques, perhaps like atomoxetine, things like you know, there are approaches we can use that might give people a bit of a leg up. Um, and the, 
uh, this was a, a statement that Tanya, you had made before. And in the last talk, people weren't there. We just see a very alarming thing about accessing care, which is that individuals who leave an emergency department, have been in an emergency department several times with a substance use disorder, are less likely to have psychiatric follow-up than other people. Your odds ratio is decrease the chances you're going to get care. And, and that's, you know, what psychiatrist is a very alarming and, and unfortunate state to be in. It means you in, in the RAM clinics, in uh, an addictions clinic, may be the person who gets the most contact. And unfortunately, um, you know, I think it means you may be in this situation needing to co-manage or manage this on your own. The, did you want to add anything, Tanya, about your experiences in the RAM clinic then? Uh, yeah, I mean, just that uh, similarly to, to think about treatment, to be cautious. I would say with Adderall, somebody just asked about Adderall, um, I tend to be cautious because it can be very easily converted to a far shorter acting compound with a much higher risk of psychosis. And so um, that's why Vyvanse would, would be often preferred and just like more caution if the person has a significant history of psychosis or hospitalization for psychosis. And just to, to kind of end our talk, I, I wanted to just mention some of the like harm reduction kinds of approaches that we can use. Uh, um, <clears throat> you know, many of the harms, including psychosis and some of the, the effects, like the withdrawal effects, the depression, are very dose dependent. And, and people's doses is very root of administration based. So if someone can make a change in the root, sorry, it's good, in the root of administration, they may bring down the dose sufficiently to alleviate some of the most difficult symptoms they have. And so both trying to just give people more safety by helping them get access to new unused syringes, to have better practices for injection, to know how to do these safely. This is, since there is a, also a large relapse rate, making sure people know where to get help to make sure their use is as safe as possible can be important uh, for smoking, you know, passing on a pipe that, that could get hot and can burn your lips is, is a concern of, of transmission for hepatitis C and B. So, so being able to <clears throat> help people with these is important. I have seen people have gotten better by just changing the route of administration. So they start, they, they inject or smoke less and might snort or ingest it more. And while it might be a different feeling that they're not used to, for some people that's been helpful in beginning to make a change for themselves. Uh, there are drug testing facilities uh, in Toronto. Uh, they're helpful in other places. People have been testing using fentanyl strips to see whether or not there's fentanyl laced in methamphetamine, which can be important for the opiate naive user who would be um, really at risk if they ended up using something that was contaminated. Um, and then helping people with like some sort of breaks, vacations, rest from their use can be a, a good way to start and getting people shifting their, their patterns of use that might help alleviate uh, some problems. And there's an Ottawa group that has tried a safer supply project. They've got a, um, you know, I think that this is, this again is an area where we don't have a lot of research. We've got some evaluation. It, it'll be hard to imagine a randomized trial for this, but there are things to know that are out there and they're happening. Um, and I'm shamelessly putting in a plug for a research trial that uh, we will be launching in the next few weeks. So in Toronto, people who want to come in and be involved in group and individual therapy for uh, a development of a new methamphetamine intervention that's going to try to deal with the sexual parts as well. Um, there's a QR code there that uh, you can share. I will, I think that is my last slide. I will, uh, now move for us to there's some references and we can certainly share these. So lastly, I guess I'm going to turn it back to you for. Sure. Well, that was a terrific talk and you can see, I think you're both following the chat. So you can see there's been a really lively uh, discussion here. So I'm going to jump to some of the questions, although I have my own, but I'm going to do someone else's first. Um, if you're considering Vyvanse for ADHD and stimulant use disorder, do you wait until abstinence, how long, or start with ongoing use and counsel about medical risks of multiple stimulants prescribed plus, plus street? And that's from Jesse. 
That's a great question. I, I, my tendency is to first try to convince people to try a non-stimulant first. Uh, so I would tend to try to see, like, look, I know that the, the effects for atomoxetine might be less or for guanfacine might be less potent for ADHD. Um, and I wonder if there's two reasons I suggest that is one is if you use on top of it, you've got two stimulants and any of the the problems that might come from higher blood pressure, higher heart rate, the cardiac implications, like I'd rather protect you from that as much as possible or to some degree. Um, so I would tend to not use if someone is actively using a lot and, or has a very, very high risk for relapse and to try other things first. Mostly I found that's working for people, but I have people who are using kind of, I'm more likely to see people who are using every few weeks or every week, um, which is different than the daily injecting population. Tanya, do you have a different? Yeah, I think similar. I wish, I mean, there isn't like very clear guidance. I think it's evolving. Um, I think like some stability is helpful. Early recovery, having a discussion that like if there's a massive destabilization, someone goes back to like multiple grams of, of cocaine in a day, we're going to hold it and kind of having that documented beforehand. Um, if we're going to do that and having a plan of like, maybe you'll go back to detox if that worked. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's that's part of it. And then generally we'll have like some kind of escalating supply. So we're not going to do 30 days of, of Vyvanse dispensed on day one. Um, depends what we might do a week. We might do daily dispense depending on their kind of overall stability um, and what the goal is if it's for, uh, you know, off-label craving prevention versus, um, you know, mainly for treating ADHD in someone who's more stable and has been maybe stable for like three months. So maybe it's a good time for my question because it's related to this. So, you know, we were discussing and actually, Tim, you brought up some of the like maybe potential harms of having a prescribed stimulant and a street stimulant. On the cognitive side, right, you know, it may seem like we're using the stimulant to help cognition. But is it, you know, do you think it's possible that, you know, if somebody like depending on how someone's using the prescribed stimulant, if they're trying to avoid withdrawal, um, is it? Like, I guess I worry that maybe withdrawal is also a time when the brain heals a little bit. So maybe you, you lose these small windows of healing that you would actually have if you had withdrawal as uncomfortable as it is. So it's just, I think it's, see if you guys have any thoughts on that. This was a discussion I think we had two nights ago because we, we, <laughs> we both have been feeling like my personal worry is that, yeah, that one, you, you use a stimulant, it can be priming. Like you can get the same feeling and won't be quite as, like your usual use but it will elevate you and that's hard to but i wonder like are you just subjecting your brain to ongoing extra dopamine release at a time that you need a little bit you need less in order to get some repair and recovery in your brain yeah as a, a kind of related point and i think there was an earlier um a question about um you know what about people who it helps their focus i think mean, that's totally true i need a lot of people who um, just have like a temperament, um, you know, consistent with ADHD. They they absolutely don't want to do any office work. They work outdoors. They work in high adrenaline places, or they prefer that. Um, they've been involved in in high intensity sports for most of their life with a lot of impulsivity, and now they've used cocaine. And what I struggle with is like initially it was to focus, but it rapidly developed a different function of use in addition. So there might be two functions of use. You have a function of use of like it helped me get through college and a function of use of like when I'm really stressed at the end of the day, I use three grams of cocaine and like that's a totally different function of use. And it becomes really hard to like separate those things. So again, the psychotherapy can be helpful and the replacement behaviors to also address that because and no replacement we give, even if we're giving it, is going to achieve that. And if the expectation is, um, you know, I'm going to I'm going to completely dissociate and like forget about my boss. That's not going to happen with 70 milligrams of Vyvanse, right? Great, great point. Right. And I guess, um, the last thing, sorry, just to say one of the things like the, the assessment of ADHD in a person who's kind of in a, a using period or in withdrawal is very difficult. And, and with the current popularity of TikTok explaining to everybody what diagnosis they have and why, which is not necessarily always aligned with what we would think is the diagnostic criteria, I think it becomes very difficult to disentangle, like, is this difficulty with concentration and focus also potentially a a negative long-term consequence from your ongoing stimulant use. And so 
I think it just to add to the muddied waters. Um, so semi-related question to the cognition part from Delusha. Um, considering cognitive issues involved with stimulant use, how soon after abstinence would you initiate psychotherapy and what type would you start with? I start with motivation interviewing with the person while they're still using. So when I was at St. Michael's Hospital working on an addictions team there, we would have people in hospital who had been admitted who are clearly also still going out, but we invite them to a motivational interviewing group just to check it out. And, to, and we had a very we feed people, like, like Tanya said in previous ones, like give people food, get them nourished, and just make it a kind of comfortable environment to talk about whatever issue they want. And frequently your conversation will come back to the substance use. And so motivational interviewing, I think you can do right from the get go. We tended here now at HQ, we have three levels of our motivational interviewing group. We have a group that that you come and you drop in and that's kind of changing each week. But if you start coming regularly, we move you into a closed group. So now you get close to the people you're with to do MI and then we move you forward into CRA. So we're we're kind of personalizing our trajectory through psychotherapy, but trying to get people in the habit of showing up and doing that as early as possible. So it becomes part of, of their routine. Super, question from Charles King. Do you have a strategy for managing a taper or withdrawal for patients misusing high doses of non-prescribed amphetamines like Adderall? Tanya, do you? Um, I do think it, I, and this is actually to Marilyn's question as well. I do think they're non-pharmacological interventions. I think it's underused to use a non-medical detoxes for this purpose if it's really not going well. Um, it depends what the symptoms are. We will often use like a low dose of for a couple of days mirtazapine. I think it's more like the food and snacks and comfort and like weighted blankets and hot showers and just like having people around. I think even it, we often will use even like CMHA crisis beds, um, although you can't acutely detox there. But the reality is like it's like a safe if you're not in active psychosis, like a safe place where there's people um, who can help is actually like a big part. I don't find that there's like a clear and, and often the anticipation over the symptoms people will be telling me by day five i'm just really worried when the withdrawal will start and i'll be like i think i think you're like you're good like actually now you're sleeping and you're like on regular schedule and you're like i'm not sure what we're waiting for anymore i think i think you're now there's still the cravings and the like life is in chaos and there's all this other stuff we got to figure out but that cute stuff has actually sort of sorted itself out Thank you. And from Jeff Wheatley, what level of concern would you have for increased risk of adverse cardiac events, adding a psychostimulant uh, to some, for someone who has harm reduction as a goal? So for me in this, it entirely depends on how, like there are some people I work with who are very chaotic in their use and some people are very planned in their use. For the people who are planned, who can like, like I'm going to stop this and can stop it. Like I won't take it the days that because I know I'm going to use. I, I'm I'm less concerned. I'm concerned about the person who uses impulsively on top of it. So because the medications we're going to give for stimulants are going to wear off of the course of that day. That's the goal, right? Like you give a child a stimulant in the morning, you want it to wear off by the end of the day so the parents can lose their mind when their child is at home um, being inattentive. No, so that they will eat and so that they will sleep so that you can also sleep, right? So, but you, you want the blood level to fall to zero by the end of the day. That's the intention. So if a person whose use habit, they would use, take the Vivance in the morning routinely and they might only ever use late in the evening, I would, and, and they are likely to maintain that. I think that's, you know, like the, the risk is, is lower and they're taking the risks anyway. So I kind of feel less concerned about it. Does that make sense? But I, for a person where they have very little of that sort of planning ability and things come up very quickly, then, then sometimes I've used like daily dispense types of arrangements. Like if I have someone, I need them to get their HIV meds and I want them to take their antipsychotics, I might have like, well, okay, at the pharmacy, your HIV meds, your antipsychotic and this, and they get that in a day. And I'm asking the pharmacist to make a, a judgment call of if they look very stimulant, uh, intoxicated, please hold the Vyvanse. Yeah, pharmacy, this was our other a message in the other talk too, was like pharmacy is so helpful and so important to safety. I just want to quickly jump on Rudia's question, if that's okay, um, just for the occasional person who uses meth very rarely, or sorry, who uses, who uses meth, uses heroin rarely, 
Uh, naltrexone is a superpower sometimes. I will say there's some people where we have recurrent overdoses where we've even gone down more of an OET route because we're really afraid they're going to die, even if they're only using opioids every couple of weeks. It's just become such a hazard. For other people where it's really rare and accidental, um, using naltrexone, I wish that's why I wish we had IM naltrexone in Canada. That would really be where it would be helpful um, for preventing those overdoses and for the cravings and for the overall impulsivity benefit and for the alcohol use. And Marilyn had a question about like a non-pharmacological intervention to support withdrawal. The one thing I hear consistently from people is marijuana helps them. And whether this is a psychological effect of switching from one smoke thing to another smoke thing, or if there's something in smoking marijuana or CBD that is helping managing withdrawal, like I, I just hear it all the time. But there's no evidence. I'm just saying this is something that I hear. And uh, Marilyn, I don't use Nebulon much to her question, just because most of the folks I see in this situation are also hearing things, seeing things, and paranoid, and I'm afraid I'm going to really tip them over, and they'll lose their ability to stay in the environment they're in. Um, that's my big concern, because it's essentially a THC analog. If they don't have any of those things, I think it would be more of a reasonable trial off-label. Um, thank you. So, oh, no, go ahead, Tim. I was going to say, as you can tell from what we're saying, a lot of art, not science in some of what we're doing. And it, it really is case by case and kind of rechanging your minds. Sorry, Leslie. No, no, that's great. Well, I just, you know, that was an incredible question and answer period. You were very fast getting to so many of those questions, even answer the chocolate question, you know, in the text. If anyone missed that, check your, check your uh, chat. Um, and it was such a great and helpful talk on such an important topic. So thank you so much, Tim and Tanya, and to our over, I see 145 attendees are still here. So just a huge thank you to everyone for coming and stimulating such a great conversation. So thank you to our speakers. See everyone see you tomorrow. tomorrow. Have a great weekend. Thank you.